Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another installment of Jam More Interviews. I'm your host, Josh, aka Jam More, and today I'll be speaking to the voice of Adal Gohan and the narrator of Dragon Ball Z, Fat Gum and My Hero Academia, Super Scrolls Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and over a thousand characters. Can I please have a rounding rouse of applause for the amazing, the talented, and kind man, Kyle Abair? There we go. There we go. Can you hear me? I hear you. Do you hear me? There we go. You're a little low, just a little, just a little low. But maybe it's my fault. Well. There we go. Hello, sir. Welcome. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Now, before I get into my questions and say what I have to say, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I was super excited to do this. Besides being a major part of my childhood, I was really excited to talk to you because I went back and I looked at some of your posts and looked at some of the things you said, and we have a lot in common. So I was just really super excited to get to talk to you and just thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. A couple of cool things I found out while looking into your history was that you started off your voice acting career in radio for Radio Disney under the stage name Squeegee. What was that like? Uh, that was like a virtual playground for me because uh, growing up, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to be a DJ on the radio and I wanted to voice for cartoons. And the first professional thing that I got to do was, was uh, after getting a degree in radio, TV, film, I was able to get an internship at a radio network and uh, work as a DJ on the radio through different formats. Uh, I did hard rock, heavy metal. I did top 40, I did classic country and then kids radio with Radio Disney starting in 96. And they just ended like a month or two ago. They, they signed off the air. It's like the end of an era. But I was there from day one on November 18th, Mickey and Minnie's birthday. Uh, 96 and I left in 2005 to uh, pursue the voice acting thing full time and move to Los Angeles from Dallas. What was that move like? The move was scary, man. I mean, I would think, you know, if you're in one place your entire life and your whole existence is there, your friends, your family, your job, and you're, you're deciding to, you know, chase a dream and you're not even sure if it's going to be, if it's uh, going to pay off, you know, it's all a risk. So that was like the scariest time in my life because I didn't know what the future held. I walked away from a full-time job in radio, you know, with, with nice insurance benefits and a decent enough paycheck. And, you know, you become freelance and anyone, any artist or a uh, personal business owner knows that you don't know where the next paycheck is going to come from. And that could be overwhelming and take its toll on your mental state you know um but i knew that i wanted to accept those risks and uh try and follow through i, I decided that i mean early on i decided that it was going to be something that uh i wanted to at least try instead of wondering what if i didn't want to have that regret as unfortunately i think a lot of people do sometimes they may have a steady job or or maybe even great income and and live in a really really nice house and drive a fast car but are they happy creatively you know if they find a job or career path that that feeds their soul i think that's that's um, you know and if you're able to cobble a living together then that's the best of all worlds I feel like people are sometimes scared to take a risk because it's going into something new and unknown and the unknown is really scary. So it, it, it could be a challenge to dive into something that you've never done before. Like, the, for example, like these interviews I'm doing right now is sort of a leap of faith. I didn't know this was going to go far. I, I really didn't intend to take this far like at all. I really was going to end it after like doing three of them. I was like, yeah, just let, let me just end it. But people tell, told me to keep going and they've really enjoyed it. So I just decided to keep going with it but you know it's, it's been a ton of fun to do another cool thing i found out about you is you won people's choice award for best male supporting vocal performance in an anime television serial series as uh, aizen and bleach in 2014 what was your reaction to receiving that uh i always just my it just blows my mind that uh i get i get so much support uh, from the fans and I'll, I want I want to do right by them and do the character justice and, and everything like that so when you have these these tentpole franchises like like 
Bleach or, you know, Gurren Lagann, I think I won an award in 2009. And it's like, wow, this is, I mean, you pinch yourself, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, this is crazy. I'm doing something that I love to do. And, uh, you know, getting recognized for that obviously is a huge honor. And uh, any chance to return to those roles, whether it's through video games or sequel series or whatnot, is obviously going to be a blast to do, you know, especially if you've done these characters before. And, uh, you know, see what new adventures uh, unfold. You've done an amazing job. Like I said, you've voiced like thousands of characters. I mean, I just scroll through your IMDB. I always say IMDB. I don't know why I do that, but I think everyone does that as IMDB. You just see like tons of roles you've done and background characters you've voiced. And it's just so cool to see all that. I just find it so cool when I speak to voice actors or actors in general. I just find it so cool when I find out things that they've done or that they've been with me since I was a little kid like you. I mean, we're going to definitely talk about it. I mean, we're going to talk about Gohan. Like, you've been a major part of my childhood. And it's just so cool to, to learn about all that stuff. Because I didn't really pick up on a lot of this stuff because uh, when you hear, when I heard, used to hear voices in cartoons, I, I didn't really notice it. But like when I picked up on you or as a voice actor in general, I hear it, you know, you like hear their cadence and stuff. And it's just really cool to go back to that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah. My first question to you is, what would you say is one childhood memory that you would say defines you? Defines me. Well, I'm a big nerd, you know, big geek, big pop culture fan, <laughs> movie, multimedia, tech and all that. And I guess that really, really happened in 1977 because I'm old. I saw old school Star Wars before it was called A New Hope. It was just plain Star Wars in 1977. And opening weekend in the theater, the big crowd, uh, standing in line for hours and just watching this transformative experience, this movie that, that defined the genre and pop culture in so many ways and so influential uh, in so many aspects as well. I would say that that's probably it. Another is just watching classic cartoons and finding that drive to uh, to want to do uh, what Mel Blanc, the late great Mel Blanc did with Looney Tunes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was about to say when I was looking uh, into you, that you, you're one of your influences growing up was Mel Blanc and the stuff that he did. Um, yeah. I, I, I spoke to uh, Greg Berger, who's another voice actor who loves, oh, yeah. Mel, loves Mel Blanc. And it's like, it's like really crazy to see how influential like that guy is. Um, he, he obviously was big in Looney Tunes, but I, I'm not aware of some, I, I think he did Bugs Bunny, right? And stuff like that. And he did Bugs Bunny. I mean, if it was a Warner Brothers cartoon, chances are it was him. There were a few smaller characters that some other people voiced, but for the most part, yeah, it was the Mel Blanc show, and he was he was basically instrumental also in uh, getting voice actors listed in the credits. You know, for the longest time, you wouldn't even see who did the voices. It's like, well, if you're crediting the animators, why wouldn't you credit the actors that are helping put those things together? You know, and you know he went he went toe to toe with Warner Brothers for a while trying to get more pay and more recognition because this was such a huge thing back in the old days cartoons played before movies in the theater there was no television so uh he fought for for getting credit on there and that's why you know granted they go by fast and if you're streaming you know don't hit the button too fast or else you miss the credits <laughs> And you'll see like, oh yeah, I recognize that person, that person, that person. If you stay late in the movies, you can usually see someone from the anime or the video game world or cartoon world that have gotten to voice things in major films, so yeah. That's so cool to learn how influential he was. Like, oh my, I would love to spoke to him about all the stuff he does. Cause I, I, I'll, honestly, I hear most of the time like voice actors always talk about him like how he's such a big influence and it's just like so cool to hear that from because i didn't know that like that's something new i just like i didn't know that he fought for stuff like that that's really freaking cool <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of those uh a lot of the early movie stars or tv stars were radio stars first so they were they were doing voiceover they were doing radio dramas and 
all sorts of stuff. And, you know, they, they came from that background. And, you know, Mel Blanc, uh, I don't know if he did movies so much, but he did have his own TV show at one point. And, of course, the cartoons are the definitive uh, career highlight for him throughout the uh, the decades. So, yeah, yeah, I, I wish I had had a chance to, to meet him or or any of that. And I know other people who have, who have gotten to meet him through the years. I think he passed away right after Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I think that was the last uh, thing that he voiced uh, in the late 80s. Uh, it was a sequence with Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse on screen at the same time. That was historic too. You had not seen a crossover like that in the cartoon world. <laughs> That's so dope. Another question I wanted to ask is what type of kid were you like in high school? Were you the bookworm? Were you the class clown? Were were you the jive book? What were you? None of those. I was the big nerd, recluse, quiet guy who would have a, a handful of friends on the drum line. We were all drummers. So I was the band geek, but I was on the drum line. I'm cool. I play drums. Uh, so yeah, kind of an inward class clown. I have a great sense of humor, but it's like I was so shy and I felt awkward. That, you know, the awkward teen years, everyone goes through it. And I wasn't sure. You know, I'm not going to embarrass myself and all that, but a big sci-fi nerd. You know, I loved going to the movies. I loved going to the arcade, you know, hang with friends. But I, I mostly love just watching movies and TVs and listening to radio or cassettes, you know, at home, uh, doing all that sort of thing or playing my drums. I had a drum set and I would play every day. I love drums so much. I, fun story, I asked my mom for a pair of drums. I just, I just love it. I watch drum cams like every day and I asked my mom for a drum kit and she said, absolutely not, but you can have a guitar. And I was like, I'll, I'll take it. So I'll play guitar now, but I've always been drawn to the drums. And one of my best friends uh, plays in the band who's in here right now, but he was a band kid too and did stuff like that. That's really dope to hear that you come from, do you still play drums to this day? No, because my whole adult life, I've lived in apartments and you know, you obviously can't do that. You're gonna get the neighbors calling the police and all that stuff and get kicked out. I mean, it's different if you live in a house or, you know, you're you're walled off in a, in a garage or something that's not gonna drive the neighbors too crazy. Or, you know, alternatively, I guess I could buy an electronic drum kit and just put the headphones on. I could do that, but uh, I haven't really followed through with that so much uh, in a very, very long time. But uh, maybe one day, maybe one day, I think it would be fun. Yeah, I, I would, that would that definitely be a cool thing to get back into because it's always cool getting back into instruments or stuff you used to do because um, I, I stopped playing trumpet for a long time after middle school and then I got back into instruments and stuff like that. It was really fun to like relearn everything and just go down the line with all those band notes and going back through my uh, stuff with my old band teacher. It was really fun, really fun. Doing oh, stuff. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I played different, different types of percussion instruments through the high school years. I was like a on snare drum in middle school and in high school. My freshman year was cymbals. And then my sophomore, junior year were like the big bass drum. Like I was the tallest guy. So I got the biggest one. It's like, oh, hurting my back. Oh, and then my, my senior year, I did the tri-toms or triple toms and all that. So that, that was fun. <laughs> Obviously, you said in the beginning that you've always wanted to be a, a voice actor since you were a little kid, which is really cool to me when I hear that because usually when I speak to voice actors, they talk about how this voice acting was an accident and it was never really the goal. They came from a theater background, an agent recommended it to them. So what would you say really cemented you wanting to do voice, voice acting as a little kid? Uh, I, think, I think, again, watching those cartoons, my dad, basically telling me all about Mel Blanc and it's like oh that's something that people can do so as a kid I would take a cassette player and record myself doing you know parody commercials or pretend DJ I'd put on records on the turntable and act like I'm introducing them and doing all sorts of different wacky voices and things and I knew that I wanted to entertain people but I didn't want them to look at me you know, going through school plays, it's like, oh, this is so nerve wracking, stage fright, and you got to memorize lines and all that. And with voiceover, no one sees you. You can look at your script the whole time. 
And, you know, you're playing characters of different age ranges and certainly looks. It's like, you don't have to look the part in voiceover. And that's so freeing, you know? The on-camera world, you know, talking to people that come from on stage or on camera, they're like, man, voiceover is a nice gig, man. You, you go and you record and then you go, you get out of there, you know? But if you're on stage, you know, these hours long rehearsals, or if you're on a film set or a TV set, you're there for 12 plus hours a day, waiting, hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait, wardrobe, light changes, cameras. And that's most of your day. It's not a glamorous thing. And voiceover, you know, you could go in your PJs, basically. Well, now, since the pandemic, everyone's recording from home. But <laughs> in, a, in a normal society where there's, you know, not viruses out there, go to a studio and record. And, you know, you don't have to do the hair and makeup. You don't have to look pretty for anyone. And uh, I think it's kind of funny that they, uh, they ask uh, voiceover uh, people to have headshots. It's like, why? I, I get it for on camera, but you know, if doesn't matter what I look like, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. That's really cool about voice acting is um just like, you know, just being behind it's it's good for people who don't really want who wanna be out there but who don't want to be out there, you know what I mean? Like just just chilling and helping people out with entertain them and stuff like that. But I've always been drawn to uh the theater. Voice acting is something I I've, I've always wanted to try. I mean, it just seems like too too far away for me you know personally I, it is something i would like to try one day but growing up i would do i mean it's all acting and that's the important thing to remember is people think you know it's a misnomer it's a myth that voice acting is all about just doing voices you're inhabiting a character you are taking skills that you obtain through either experience or lots of training with one-on-one -on -one coaches or acting workshops and all that and this takes time it's not an overnight thing but now with technology uh, and, and coming along and the price is coming down, it's so much more affordable now to be able to buy a decent enough setup to record from home. My recording space is technically my walk-in closet. You know, I didn't have to drop thousands of dollars on a recording booth or any of that. Uh, you know, for me, it just happened to work out that a closet with enough, you know, things to take the sound reflections off and all that just happened to be good enough and to make the investment in a, in, a, in a decent mic and all that. And you think about that, it's like, okay, it's expensive, but you're investing in your craft. Just like a, a doctor goes to med school, a lawyer goes to law school. You know, you want to follow a career path, you, you got to take the steps. And this is part of it, you know, training, honing your craft, taking the time, paying your dues, you know, networking and getting out there and remembering that the, the key thing is, oh, I can't be a voice actor because I can't do all those wacky voices. Like, you know, don't think of it that way. Think about, you know, if you want to do voiceover, it's all about your signature sound, you know, which nine times out of 10 is gonna be just your marketable, your own singular voice, your own speaking voice. There's so many people that do well in voiceover uh, and, you know, they basically just do commercials or, you know, audiobooks or and there's all these different things, these little sub sub genres, I guess, in, in, in voiceover that, you know, it, it's always a challenge, but it's a fun kind of challenge, depending on your own disposition. You know, if that's something that would bring you interest and, and really fulfill your soul and the creative side of you and all that, you know, I always encourage people. It's like, this is something you want to do. Definitely definitely uh you know give it a shot but just know that there's no fast easy way into the industry you can't really look at it like that you know taking shortcuts that ends up hurting yourself in the long run it, it, it doesn't doesn't pay off you you gotta you gotta invest with time with money with uh, equipment uh maybe with picking up and moving where the work is you know right now it's, it's kind of a strange time but who knows what the future holds you know yeah, I'm I'm very interested to see how like when all of this is done, like what effects this is gonna have like on the voice acting industry is is or uh, because I usually hear like, hey, if you wanna do voice acting, move to LA or like move to like a big city, you know. And I hear that a lot. So I just wonder if that's still gonna be the case or if they're gonna be like, Hey, we have film now. So if you don't wanna move to LA then join the Zoom call or something. I don't I don't I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, it's uh it's literally a thing where you know, in the anime world, at least, we're noticing that the L.A. talent pool is kind of mix and mingling with the Texas talent pool with Funimation or Sentai in Houston, New York even. And we're all just kind of cross pollinating. And I think it's great. 
And you know, if the technology's there and, and the people have a good home setup and, and all that, you know, who's to say that someone in the middle of nowhere, anywhere on the planet, isn't capable of, of, of doing the same thing. And that's exciting, that's encouraging, and this is one of those few industries that have actually flourished despite the world coming to a stop. Yeah, because because with everything like when the pandemic hit, also it's the one year anniversary of the pandemic. So, um, yeah, <laughs> right. I I I still remember um, when when they they told me that my my school was shutting down. I thought like, oh, we're gonna be gone for like a few days, or like a few weeks. We'll be back, and then they kept saying we'll be off for two weeks, and then four weeks, and then we're done for a month, and then it just closed. I was like, we're we're not going back at all. <laughs> but yeah everything shut down like Hollywood had to shut down but voice acting you know had to transition because of home studios and stuff like that to, to doing it virtually so yeah that makes a lot of sense kudos, kudos to the engineers who really know the ins and outs of, of the of the sound stuff and equipment and know-how because they they had to basically hold our hands all the voice actors and say all right you need this kind of mic to really upgrade the broadcast quality and this sort of interface and this, that, and the other, and we're going to test the sound with your recording space and make sure it's up to snuff and all that stuff. And they, they're like the unsung heroes of, of recording anyway. You know, the, the reason things sound so good and the mixes are so good. And, you know, that's one piece of the puzzle that, that they don't get enough recognition. So hats off to all the engineers for, for helping the actors um, get uh, get up to, up to speed with everything. And, you know, we're able to use Skype or Zoom or, or things to visually look at what we're dubbing or recording the script for and, you know, sound recording systems like Source Connect. Uh, there's there's multiple things that have like a digital patch. So it sounds like you're in the same room so they can record on their side. I can record on my side, a backup recording. And then the, I mean, everyone's at home. I mean, sometimes the engineer goes into the studio, but the director could be at home. I'm at my home and everyone's saving time from schlepping across town and traffic and all that stuff. It's like, no, oh, I think I'll wake up and go into the recording space and have my coffee and be good to go. <laughs> right. Well, I would assume that's one thing that we as have been liking about recording from home is the traffic not being bad because <laughs> I hear LA uh, traffic is notorious for being the worst thing on the planet. <laughs> well, it's up there. I mean, I moved from another traffic hell scape, which is Texas. You know, Dallas is one of those booming cities. And, you know, here during the pandemic, people are, are moving away from more expensive places like California in droves because it's so much cheaper to live in Texas. You know, and, you know, if I knew that voice work could be continuing to do from home from here on out, I might consider moving. You know, because uh, it's stupid expensive. The cost of living is just ridiculous in, in California. But for whatever reason, you know, this is this is the hot spot. This is Hollywood. This is where it happens. Now I want to talk about a role that uh, has really changed that you did. It's really changed my life for the for for better. And it's uh, of course, it's of course, Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> and before I talk about and ask you questions about Dragon Ball Z. Thoughts on the live action movie? Uh, I've seen worse movies, but it is a really awful adaptation. And it is a prime example of why anime should just be left alone. <laughs> and it's like, let's not try and, and, and change things. You know, when you take a book and adapt it into live action, people will inevitably compare it or comic books to live action whatnot but there's way more good good crossover experiences there between the mediums more so than anime we've had like bad anime adaptations and hopefully we'll we'll get it right you know maybe cowboy bebop will be good maybe the live action helsing will be good for amazon because you got john wick's writers working on it and we'll see we'll see but for right now i'm like just leave it be in the in, in the in the in the medium that it was presented in because i'm not so sure that dragon ball would work in live action i mean i haven't seen it really done well yet the fight stuff with special effects sure i remember watching the third matrix movie and it's like wow that's a dbz fight that's totally you know it's smith and neo swirling through the air and all this stuff 
and you watch even WandaVision with these mid-air battles and everything, it's like, that's so anime. That is totally anime. But yeah. you know, it's different for things to be an inspiration for, but it's like the bean counters, AKA the people that green light the projects of the studios, they see dollar bills, but you know, they don't understand the creative process and, and you know, you get too many cooks in the kitchen and throwing in their two cents and suddenly you had a, a faithful first draft screenplay that turns into something really, really far from the source material and you get a ghost in the shell and like, hmm, okay, visually, yeah, it's fine, you get it, but the story, you get away from, from what made Ghost in the Shell so great and you can't just, you know, encapsulate it down into some generic action flick, you know? Absolutely. I completely agree with you there because whenever I hear an anime is going to be turned to a live action, I cringe a little bit. I'm like, oh no, I'm like, oh no. I heard they did uh, like Death Note on Netflix. It was a terrible movie. I don't know why they did that. It was really bad. I don't I have no idea why they decided to do that. Then they did a live action Full Metal Alchemist. I didn't like that either. And it's just like they keep making the, or like when they make like live action uh, for cartoons, like they're gonna do a, a live action Powerpuff Girls TV show on, on CW. And I'm just like, what are we doing? And then, uh, what was there was one they did on Netflix that people hated Winx Club there was Winx Club was like a, a girl cartoon and then yeah. it turns to a live action show and it looks awful it looks nothing it doesn't have like the color or whatever I'm just like this is oh god it's really bad not that I watched it but people have told me on the, on the internet it's like it's nothing like it so it's just like just leave them alone like we have the cartoon or like I was talking the last airbender I'm not looking forward to that TV show at all I'm not whatsoever and the original creators leaving Avatar the last airbender from that show is not good signs at all and apparently they want to age them up and like get rid of characters and I'm just like what do you stop 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 and cancel it let's work on something else make another Netflix original let's get Stranger Things season four <laughs> or something I don't know yeah. Again, more prime examples of why this, this shouldn't happen. You get you get people who think they know what they're doing, but they don't. And it's like, here, you stay on your part of the playground. Just trust us. You know, if you want to be a big studio that's that's popular and you've got a, a good loyal fan base, green light the projects, but let the creatives handle the creative. This is why Marvel is flourishing. Yeah, I think it would be a mistake for Disney to acquire Marvel and then try and just run all their stuff, which they fortunately have not done. They have let Marvel do their thing. They let Star Wars do their thing. And, you know, it's just like, just let it be. Let it breathe. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But then I ask the question about Dragon Ball Z. How did that get brought up to you? Or how did you audition for that? I know Funimation is in Texas, if I'm correct. Oh yeah, yeah. And I used to be in Dallas. That's where I worked in radio. And that's where I lived my whole life until 2005. So learning about Funimation there, this was 20 years ago, 21 years ago, actually, back in 2000. I'd go in and hear about auditions through my radio job, actually. Uh, people at Radio Disney uh, said, hey, they got open auditions and we know this is the sort of thing you want to do. It's like, oh yeah, I've heard of Dragon Ball Z. I was already a fan of that show. Um, because the first two sagas aired on Cartoon Network and sometimes independent stations in the middle of the night or four or 5 a.m. in the morning on Saturdays. And you'd have to like, you had VCRs back then and my flash 12, because I didn't know how to program it. It's like, all right, I got to sit down and learn how to program a VCR because I want to take this show. I want to see what, it, what all the hubbub's about. Reading about Dragon Ball in a magazine that doesn't exist anymore called An America. And learning this like okay so this is different than the simpsons it's different than charlie brown these characters you know some of them start as kids and then they grow up and then they get married and they have kids and it's a little more a little more reality based not totally the storyline <laughs> out there you know, people look at you like you're crazy when you're trying to tell them the plot of dragon ball but uh, <laughs> but the basic core qualities of the characters are really what resonate and that's true of any genre you know whether it's live action or anime or games or whatnot it's like you, you, you have those relatable qualities and characters so i was already cemented as a fan of anime in general uh, and then getting to work on a show 
that I was already a fan of. Plus that unlocks my career bucket list thing. It's like, oh, I get, to, all right, I've done the DJ thing. Now I want to do the voiceover thing. Whoa, this is unreal. This is this is crazy. So it's like, I got to think of new bucket list things to do. It's like, well, I need to do cartoons, cartoons. I got to do more cartoons. But Dragon Ball Z is the show that started my career and has opened so many doors through the years. One thing led to another. It's just a little domino effect, you know? Um, networking with other voice talent or directors through the convention scene. Dragon Ball Z got me on the convention scene as a guest instead of just as a fan, which I was used to going to. And then suddenly I'm meeting other people and, you know, suddenly getting uh, audition opportunities and then uh, all that stuff. And that all started in 2000 when I go in and I try out and I read for Gohan, the adult version of Gohan. And, uh, and then I ended up becoming the narrator. I took over the narrator role. I ended up taking over Ox King. I was West Kai and PyCon. And I get to revisit some of those even minor characters through the years, through the video games and some of the new movies too. And you know, uh, it's, it's the gift that keeps giving. You know, it's, uh, it's something that means so much to me personally and professionally. Uh, that it still means something to the fans who are now a newer generation. You know, they're having kids and they're introducing their kids to Dragon Ball. It's like, this is old school, but it's so awesome, you know? Yeah, and, and Dragon Ball has been around forever. I remember my mom showing me Dragon Ball Z Kai and I was just like glued to the screen when I watched it because it came on Nickelodeon. I think we had just finished an Avatar Last Airbender episode and she saw a Dragon Ball and she like, like audibly gasped and she was like joshua we're gonna watch this i was like um okay sure why not and that was my first time experiencing dragon ball i've just been in love with that show ever since and everyone does a great job you do a great job i remember hearing you as the narrator and it's going and it's just like i just have so many childhood memories that i can connect to your voice and just everyone involved with the project in general at large and it's just so 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 cool shout what out to Boy, that's cool. That's cool. So you are literally from one of those families where the where the parents show their kids. It's like this is the show that meant something to me, and now here's this opportunity to show it to you. And it's like that's great. That's great. I've loved it ever since. My mom, we we go back and we watch it from time and time. And now I'm showing up my little brother, and then we rewatch it. And it's just like it's a whole domino effect. And it's just yeah. so cool. I'm gonna show Dragon Ball Z to my kids. I have. Almost every single Dragon Ball video game I have, uh, is, I'm looking at Raging Blast right now. I have Budokai Tenkaichi, I have Raging Blast on Xbox, Fighter Z, uh, Xenoverse, and uh, yeah, I think that's, I, I definitely have more, <laughs> but I, I'm moving. Yeah, all the Budokais and. Yeah. Good times. What character besides Gohan, of course, did you have the most fun voicing? I had a blast with a very short-lived character, uh, Kamina on, on uh, Gurren Lagann. That is uh, such an inspirational, positive uh, character that has influenced so many fans that, that love that show. And the show is one of those things that you can't just write off as a certain genre. It's like, oh, it's just another mech show. It's like, no, if you watch Gurren Lagann and then a Gundam show, they're completely different, even though they both have giant robots in them that are piloted by people. Completely different shows. And um, that that was that was really cool to get to to inhabit that character. As any actor would, you know, it's like, ooh, who do we play in today? You know, just like Aizen is there something that's polar opposite of, of you as a person. And it's like, wow, what am I now? I'm mysterious and evil, or I'm super positive and everything. Ryu is another one from Street Fighter. You know, man, an iconic franchise, an iconic character. And it's like, oh, I get to do this for the English version. And it's like, dude, pinch me, man. This is wild. You've been real since 2009. Like, that's a, like that's really cool. That's another childhood for a favorite of mine. And I was actually introduced to Rio through your voice. Like, that was my first time 
hear you, and that's so dope. Hold on, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to bend down and pull it up, but there's a game right there, the Street Fighter. I think it was like I, oh gosh, I can't remember what it was, but I played that game so much with my mom and my yeah. little brother. I beat my mom in that game ridiculously. Let's not talk about that though. But <laughs> I was used to a do can and go go crazy with all the characters and, and, and all of them. But yeah, I, I, what is that experience like being? Ryu, like what has that done for you as a person? Well, it, it tells me that I am definitely going to continue on this this career path because I have so much fun, and it just again goes back to that feeding your soul thing. You know, it's like, oh, they're going to pay me to have fun. I like that. Uh, and, and being a gamer, a terrible gamer, but I've always loved video games, and you know, getting to play a character that you can play as, as a player, that's pretty cool, you know, I gotta say. Yeah, I see that you do a Twitch stream where I, last one he did, I think he was like playing Call of Duty. I was like, he's a gamer too, and like he loves Marvel, and he was talking about WandaVision, and speaking of WandaVision, you voiced a character in 2013 that was in WandaVision, and you know who that is? I did, on uh, the Marvel Online, uh, game, I got to be Wiccan, an older version of Wiccan, but still he's basically known as a teenage character and I had to go back and look, I looked on YouTube because I haven't played the Marvel uh, experience like that uh, online, but I know that YouTube has clips for everything so I look up, where's where's Wiccan? I want to hear it, it's like, so I could hear me it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah that's cool, that's cool so yeah, that that's pretty wild. That's something so obscure, you know, as a, as a little more mainstream now, thanks to Wandavision. You also have like a Legion poster in your room, and when I found you had a Legion poster, I was like, yo, people don't talk about that show enough. I, I love Legion. I really love that show. And I know it's people. It's a unique show. It, it it's yeah, just like the beginning episodes of Wandavision. It's like people are like, this is so different. This is not the superhero show I signed up for. It's like, just you wait. You know, if, gonna, yeah. in your mind. and Legion is this fantastic journey of weirdness and psychedelics and music, and it's just a perfect fusion of those and such a great cast. And and it's a Marvel show. It's like, remember, guys, this this is uh, this is Professor X's son, Legion. You know. Yeah, I, I remember when I first uh, saw the season one. And I saw the first episode, and I remember like freaking out. I was so confused. I was like, "What is happening? This isn't what I thought it was gonna be." I'm, it's like all over the place. I love that first season though. That I think that's the best season in my opinion. That's the best. Se first season is the best. I do love uh, when they showed Shadow King though, but the which was season two. I was like, "Yeah, I, the guy who they cast in Shadow King was dope." Season three was good, but uh, the ending really dipped off for me. If, if but uh -huh. yeah. But to go back to Dragon Ball, you said you voiced PyCon, and the first yeah. time we saw PyCon was in, um, don't tell me because I know, it was, uh, it was, Jab it was Jabaya, right? Some, no, I know the villain was Jabaya. What was the movie called? Uh, oh, the yeah. other world. What was it, what, say it again? It was during the other world tournament? Yes, it was. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. It, it was, oh, dang. No, I can't remember. But yeah, it, there was a. It, he was the first time I saw him was in a movie uh, where Goku, where like hell had like stopped or something, and like the it turned to oh, dang. I don't know. I yeah. can't remember it. I'm gonna You're text you it. Yeah. But Fusion Reborn. Yes. There you go. Yes. Fusion Reborn. Mm, thank you. I'm so mad that I didn't know that because I love that movie. I have it on DVD. You do. Yeah, and uh, I think. I think Sean signed that for me. I have a, a Sean, Sean signed a DVD somewhere. Cool. I don't know which one though, but yeah, at a con. But what is your favorite moment with PyCon that you can remember? I loved him screaming at the at the crystal things there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that was a lot of fun. People said, you know, in the subtitles, he, he cusses, right? And it's like, yeah, well, I have to do whatever the script says. You know, we can't sit here and F-bomb everything, as fun as that would be. But uh, <laughs> that wasn't meant to be. But uh, I love that moment. The other world tournament, of course, I, I would love for him to just, you know, come back. And he has here and there through the games. 
but I would love to have him be a part of, you know, if Super comes back or whatever the next iteration of Dragon Ball is, you know, it's like, hey, let, let's give some other side characters from the past and some opportunity to shine besides Frieza, you know? Yes, oh my gosh. Oh, they always going back to Frieza. I'm like, oh, stop it. Let's get someone else. <laughs> Let's go to the movie characters. Like, I want to see Cooler again. Like, I really want to see Cooler. Oh, Bojack from the, those movies, like Bojack's Revenge. And um, of course, they brought Broly back in the, in the movie, which I really, which I was really happy about. But there's so many cool characters that Dragon Ball Z, like, has there's so much lore and stuff that isn't canon and is canon and it's very confusing but you know that's how these series work there's a lot of stuff in there were you involved with dragon ball gt in any uh, I, I was yeah uh gohan's in there uh not for very long but he he's in there i didn't actually see a lot of that i actually did watch all of dragon ball z but uh, GT, not so much. I had heard just so, so many bad things. It was just like, oh, this misses the mark. I mean, but I'm told that it gets really good towards the end, but it was too little too late. You know, people weren't watching it. The ratings were low and, you know, they canceled it. But Funimation's like, hey, we're completists. We got the license. Let's, let's dub it. So yeah, as a voice actor, you're like, yay. You know, when the fans go, oh God, fillers. It's like, no, no, this is great. We're working. And you gotta you gotta give the people what they want, which is usually everything. Even if they don't like every last episode, you know, it's like we gotta give you the whole thing. You know, we it's not our place to pick and choose. Speaking of filler, let's talk about Naruto, an anime with arguably one of the most filler I've ever seen in an anime show ever. But I love it. And then that show, you voice one of my favorites, Kiba. I really love Kiba, really cool character. Fun thing about Naruto is I was introduced to it very late. Uh, actually, I was introduced to it like a few months ago because we were in the pandemic. I needed something to watch after I finished Code Geass. So my friends were like literally forcing me to watch Naruto because they would text me every day talking about some, hey Josh, you watch Naruto? I'm like, no, are you watching Naruto? I was like, yes, I watched Naruto and I've fallen in love with it ever since. And he was a really cool character. I really love where, um, I think it was the shooting exams where Kiba and Naruto go at it. It was really, yeah. really fun, uh, like, art. I, I recently went back and watched that. I was like, the shooting exams are really peak Naruto. Like, I really love those battles when they were younger. And I just really loved that in the first series. But um, how did you get introduced into the Naruto world? Like, who brought that to your attention? Or were you a fan of it before dubbing it? I hadn't seen it in Japanese, you know, a few years before the dub was introduced, I would notice that a lot of kids at cons were wearing the, the headbands. And it's like, what's that about? It's like, oh, it's the latest thing, man. It's, you know, anime fans are all about the latest thing from Japan. And it's like, oh, Naruto, okay. I wonder if we'll get to dub that in English someday. And sure enough, by the time I moved to LA in 2005, the English dub had just premiered on Cartoon Network and uh, I was friends with Steve Bloom, who uh, was already doing voices on that show, Orochimaru, I think. Yes. And uh, he talked me in, it's like, uh, to the studio, Studiopolis, and said, hey, we got this guy from Dragon Ball Z from Texas, he's moving here. I think you should give him a shot. So I got to audition, and I tried out for multiple characters, including Kiba, then I got Kiba. So by Christmas of 2005, I, I got to join that cast, and because of that association, I got I was in with the studio that that uh, after that did Bleach. So, oh, that is so cool! How like I think it's just so cool how you talk about like everything connects. It's just like so cool to hear about all the connections. Um, I'm sorry to be on my phone, but there was something that I saw that I want to ask you about and see if it was true because you did mention Steve Bloom. He said um, you owe a lot to Steve Bloom for helping you get your start in California after moving from Texas. And I wanted to ask, yeah. Oops, oops, oops. We met each other at Anime Fest in Dallas as fellow guests together in 2004. And I met him and I told him, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, leaving radio and, and moving to LA. What do you think? And he totally was supportive and said, oh yeah, absolutely. With your resume, having Dragon Ball on there. It's like, yeah, you come out to LA. I'll, I'll introduce you to some of the studios. I'll walk your demo in and it's like, sweet. And he totally did. I was apartment scouting and he got me work even before I moved here. I came to town to find an apartment and record a, a demo. And I managed to, to work 
I, he got me in with Bang Zoom that uh, even to this day, I'm still recording different projects for. So that's amazing. Uh, he introduced me to his agent, who is now my agent. And uh, yeah, yeah, what a, what a truly amazing, amazing person. I constantly hear like good stuff about Steve Bloom um, and what, what he's done. Like, I mean, he's one of the biggest worst actors of all time. So it's just so cool to hear that he is very kind and very humble. Because sometimes when I hear about like bigger stars, you hear about how their ego goes to the head or sometimes they don't treat people nice. And it's really awesome to hear that he is nice, you know, off, off, off doing uh, voice acting work and also in real life. So that's really just so awesome to hear. And, and the teacher now, you know, like Blue yeah. Rock Studios. Yeah, he's helping uh, bring up the next generation, the future generation of voice actors, showing them the ropes and everything. He wasn't doing that when I met him. He was just strictly acting. But, you know, he's been doing this like 10 more years than me. So like, whoo, I bow to you, sir. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, I took a couple of those uh, voice acting classes. Uh, when I take them, I took them in like December because they were um, doing a little discount thing. And I took a couple of them. Really good, really informational. Definitely wrote a lot of stuff down to like really learn how to like master this little instrument right here and really get oh, yeah. into it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Kiba, to talk more about Kiba, you yeah. can't. He wants to has a dream. We find out that he wanted to be Hokage and stuff, and we have they joke about him and stuff like that. I heard in Baruto, he talks about how like he let Naruto become Hokage. He jokes about that and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, what characteristics in Kiba do you see in yourself? Uh, I see kind of a fierce loyalty. He's a little rough around the edges, but he's uh, he's super loyal. You know, he, he might have his own agenda, but he, he also kind of thinks about the big picture, too. And I really appreciate that that quality about him. And, you know, he comes from from uh, the Inuza Inuzuka clan, very, very tightly knit and all that the way I feel about, you know, my friends and family and everything. Uh, and plus, I'm glad that he's he's just a character who's still around. You know, he's rocking a soul patch, but, you know. <laughs> He's still there and he's a ton of fun that I get to revisit again through the games, through the years. And I here I thought, okay, well, his story's done and then Boruto continues. And I'm still recording on Boruto as various characters, Akiba once in a while, or Eno's dad, or, or some brand new characters too. Some episodic, yeah. I, I saw that you did uh, Hugo, which was previously voiced by Travis Willingham. So I wanted to ask you, um, do you know what happened there or why Travis like stopped doing the voice for him or did he not audition or? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there's various things, you know, and, and it's up to the actor, you know, it's either a personal decision. It's like, uh, I'm just not interested in doing this kind of work anymore or whatnot. I mean, he's still a voice actor, yeah. but you know, maybe, maybe it's a conflict of uh, scheduling times. Maybe you're just not available because you're too busy doing something else. You know, you know him he's married to laura bailey and those guys are rock stars you know him and troy baker and all them i mean they're doing all the big triple a games and shows and i'm not seeing them doing so much the anime work anymore and honestly i think that maybe because anime pays so low <laughs> compared to uh and even though it's the hardest kind of voice work to do it's definitely on the low end of the totem pole pay wise which makes no sense it's actually the hardest kind of voice work to do because you're matching lip sync and and doing all that but uh the cartoon world you're not matching lip sync. You're you're recording the audio first, and then they're animating to that. Uh, so yeah, different different thing altogether. So I mean, sometimes you got actors who move away, or you know, some sadly even pass away. I've 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 taken over roles from people who've uh, who've uh, unfortunately passed on, and their roles continue. So it's like, well, someone someone has to do that, and the director seems to think that I can I can fit that same register and. You know, that's, that's happened in the past with uh, Eureka 7, another one of those uh, maybe lesser known shows, but one that uh, John Gong Bosch, people know him. He was a, he was a lead on and uh, a really, really fun show directed by the great Tony Oliver, who also directed Gurren Lagann. And he goes super old school. He was Rick Hunter in Robotech, which I remember watching in high school. <laughs> yeah, he was also at Naruto as uh, Naruto's father. Yeah. Yeah, he was Minato, Minato, really, really 
great voice performance. And I, I'm a big Power Rangers guy too. So I've known him since I was little. Love Power Rangers. Love me some Mighty Yeah. Mark. Tony directed a lot of those original Power Rangers episodes. They got to film that all in New Zealand back in the day, and it's pretty wild. What similarities, now you've been in two, well, three major franchises, but two of the world's biggest anime franchises. Well, dang, you've been in Bleach, never mind. You've been in three big anime franchises, but the main piece? two I want to see, yeah. Uh, My Hero Academia behind you. Yeah, like you've been, oh my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Let me rephrase this question. What similarities do you see between the Naruto series and the Dragon Ball Z series? Uh, well, I guess they're both considered uh, shonen series, you know, really action oriented and everything. And, you know, you got, got a little more of the, the ninja martial arts sensibilities with, with, with Naruto and Dragon Ball Z. I mean, I think it's rooted in, in martial arts things. Uh, and you know throw in a hint of the supernatural in there so it's not just a straight fighting show or action show it's something a little higher a little elevated beyond that but again characters that are very very well defined tons and tons of episodes and yeah you know lots of filler too but you know something that it definitely has a fandom that is not going away i mean naruto has been done for years but you still hear people talking about it and whether they they watch Boruto or Shippuden, or if they're just fans of the original old school Naruto, they're still there and they're still dedicated. And it's it's really cool to see, just like the Dragon Ball fans. Is, there's crossover there. When you have stories that really connect with people, the characters that connect with people. Yeah, those stories, like I said, Dragon Ball has really had an effect on my life. That's really got, what really got me into anime was Dragon Ball Z. I stopped watching anime for a little bit there, but if it wasn't for Dragon Ball Z, I don't think I would have been into anime as much, or I would have been watching like Code Geass or Attack on Titan, which you were also on Attack on Bro, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. It's just like, <laughs> I was like, oh, I keep having like when I'm talking, I'm like, you're on so much. And it's just really so cool to be talking to you. Like, even though I said it, right? It's like really so cool. Cause like you've been in so much that I love. Like Attack on Titan is my top like anime of all time. I love that show. And I'm recently getting into Bleach because I heard that was coming back, even though I'm like, I'm I'm questioning if I should keep going or if I should like wait until the new stuff comes out and then like watch all of it because I'm so behind. But I'm getting into Bleach and that's good. But yeah, I love I me mean, some Attack on Titan. My family uh, loves um, my My Hero Academia, so they love this show so much. And <laughs> I have this, and I'm sure what? they know your character um, in the show, but. Now we're going to get into the fun part of my interviews, which is called Weird and Wacky, where I ask you a series of random and wacky questions, and you have a minute to answer all of them. The okay. new record, no one has gotten <laughs> no one has gotten a record of 15 questions, though someone has come close with a record of 14 questions answered, who is Simon Norfleet. Do you think you could be Simon? Let's see. Let's see if I'm up for this. Okay. All right. I'm gonna start the one minute timer in three, two, one. Worst food you've ever eaten? Worst food I've ever eaten? Uh, grapefruit. Food you refuse to cook? I refuse to cook anything. <laughs> beard or no beard? Goatee. Longest time period without taking a shower? A week. Favorite video game? Donkey Kong. Stupidest thing you did as a kid? Hmm. 18. 17. Oh. 16. Oh. 15. 13. Try to hear the trumpet when I really wanted to play the drums. Uh, super proud you wish you had. Sorry? Superpower you wish you had. Instant transmission. Dang it. Then that's the time. I got nowhere near 15. I know that. <laughs> no, you did great. You did great. Now I'm going to ask my final question. I'm going to ask, uh, there was two fan questions that I wanted to ask you. 
But before okay. I ask my final question, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Kyle, for joining. This has really been an absolute honor and privilege getting to talk to you more. And it's just, you're such a legend in this field, in the anime field in general. And it's just really so cool to be speaking to you. And I can't wait to see what you have next for the rest of the world. So thank you for joining and talking with me. Sure thing. My final question is, what is your current message to the world during these current times that we live in? Obviously, we're living in a global pandemic. Laws are being passed. Things are changing around the world. There are a lot of people who are scared and in need of hope. What would you say to people who are in need of that hope? I say, do the best you can with what you have. And what we have is the internet and social media. We can reach out to our friends and remind them that when they're going through a tough time that we are there that we support them, uh, that we use the resources we have to, you know, take care of yourself. Mental health is, is just as important, if not more important than physical health, you know, and we want to get rid of the, the stigma of mental health and people seeking counseling or therapists and, and meds and saying, oh, that's a, that's a negative thing. We want to get rid of that stigma and, and say, you know what, people need help. They, they need a reminder that uh, everyone has value and um, it is a crazy time and everyone's going through this, this, this time of self-doubt and what does the future hold, but I think there's strength in community. So uh, stay strong, strengthen your bonds with your friends and family, keep in touch with them as much as you can. And I think through the power of numbers, all of us sticking together, uh, we're gonna come out uh, triumphant. I really couldn't have put it better and I completely agree with you on the mental health thing. I'm a huge proponent of taking care of your mental state and mental health because of my own experience with it and how I didn't handle it better. I always try and make people push people to handle it in a better way or reach out to people because it really is so important. And when people say your mental health is just as important as your physical health, that's not a lie. It's really important, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm a huge proponent in that. and. That was a really beautiful message to say to the people. Um, one fan wanted me to ask you, PlayStation or Xbox? PlayStation. Not that I'm anti-Xbox. I have an Xbox One. But I just find that there's more games I'm more interested in, and a lot of my friends are also just more so often on PlayStation. I also love my Absolutely love the Switch. I love my Switch and that. And I'm starting to dip into the PC gaming a little bit, you know. Uh, I did some Among Us and Phasmophobia, and uh, I just ordered an Oculus Quest 2, so I'm gonna dip my toes in the VR world very oh. soon. I'm really excited for that. Ah, oh, another PlayStation user, Xbox can suck it. Um, but um, what, was, <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite moment when you were DJing on radio? favorite moment with DJing on radio uh golly just just anytime golly sometimes we would have celebrities I got to interview Weird Al back in golly this was 99 so after the Phantom Menace came out he had the saga begins to the tune of American Pie and that became a huge hit and I saw him that was also probably the best car concert I ever saw he had a costume change after every song and it was just so much fun to see Weird Al in concert but getting to interview him another was talking on the phone to will smith uh who we we get we had a contest on radio disney for and uh i remember just getting to go into the recording booth and record different character voices of characters that i got to make up you know it's like here we want to what do you want to do it's like oh i'll create like a like a California surfer dude guy who explains science, but like dudifies everything. It's like, why is the sky blue? All right, dude, let me lay lay some truth on you, you know, and just <laughs> make things maybe a little more palpable, you know, palpable. Uh, it's like, okay, so he's not Bill Nye the science guy. Uh, he's not dry. He's gonna try and, and connect with, with kids on a different level. Then getting to do radio dramas every week on Radio Disney, whether I was getting to write them or perform different roles of different age groups. I had so much fun in Radio Disney in so many different ways for so many years. And uh, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to do that. Uh, why did Kiba say the lame team got the lame sensei? <laughs> uh, he's blunt, so he doesn't know tact so much. It's like, 
oh, was that my inner voice speaking out of what? Maybe I, maybe I should hold back. Maybe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, and I guess is my, the last question and then I'll let you on your way is, okay. what do you, what do you want? What do you want to do in the future? Like, do you see yourself always doing voiceover or is there other fields you want to bleed into and do more? Man, uh, I definitely want to continue voice acting. I want to continue to audition for cartoons. I would love to do anything with DC or Marvel. Again, I've worked with Marvel before, but um, got to be J. Jonah Jameson on, uh, on Marvel Online and on a Spider-Man iOS Android game. This was years ago, but it's so, so much fun. And Dr. Octopus I've done. And of course, and Marvel Thanos. Heroes. First Minus Heroes got to be Super Scroll. And on Marvel Pinball, I got to be Iron Man and Odin and a couple other dudes. So yeah, a chance to uh, get cast in the superhero world. Yeah, I'm, I'm not picky. I'll, I'll take it, man. Nickelodeon, Disney, Warner Brothers. Hey guys, I'm here. I'm just down the street. I live in Burbank. All these people are just down the street from me. <laughs> All right, Kyle. Well, that was our interview. Kyle, is there anything you want to plug before you, we head out? Yeah, yeah. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Kyle A. Bear. I'm on Facebook.com slash Kyle A. Bear VO. Uh, but I'm most active on Instagram and Twitter. And of course, Discord. Discord.gg slash Kyle A. Bear. Anyone can sign up. And uh, if you want to sub to me on Twitch, my Twitch channel is Gohan with your own bad self. All one word. Gohan with your own bad self. If you uh, sub on Twitch at any level, at any tier, uh, you can join the Discord. We have a very exclusive audio chat, which we put on the Twitch channel when I'm playing with people. They can be heard as well on the stream and we, you know, we interact. And if you're uh, on the Discord, we'd love you to come by. We got some cool things going on. And of course, on social media, I'm, I'm staying out there, man, and continuing to record. I recorded uh, two different projects or three different projects this week. And I uh, can't talk about them yet, but they are coming. And trust me, you will enjoy them. Nice. Uh, someone said, could you do like a line as Eisen, I guess, what AI stands for? Oh, yes. Eisen. He is in this register. He's very easy to do because he's calm. So tell me, Rukia, does... Oh, sorry. Tell me, Renji. Does Rukia deserve to die? That's the line I remember the most. I gotta, I gotta look up quotes from Karen. <laughs> Like, I've been using the same ones, the same tired ones all this time. Like, fight you? No, I want to kill you. Next time on Dragon Ball Z. The answer lies in the heart of battle. Bye, guys. Hope you have an amazing day. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you.